Section 14 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Story of Abu Hassan, or The Sleeper Awakened, Part 4. When they arrived at the palace, the caliph ordered Abu Hassan to be laid on a sofa in the fourth hall, from whence he had been carried home fast asleep a month before, but first he bade his attendants to put him on the same habit in which he had acted the caliph, which was done. He then charged all the eunuchs, officers, ladies, and musicians who were in the hall, when he drank the last glass of wine which had put him to sleep, to be there by daybreak, and to take care to act their parts well when he should awake. He then retired to rest, charging Masrur to awake him before they went into the hall, that he might conceal himself in the closet as before. Mizrur, at the hour appointed, awakened the caliph, who immediately rose and went to the hall where Abu Hassan lay still asleep, and when he had placed himself in his closet, Mizrur and the other officers, ladies and musicians, who waited for him, went in and placed themselves about the sofa, so as not to hinder the caliph from seeing what passed, and noticing all his actions. Things being thus disposed, and the caliph's powder having had its effect, Abu Hassan began to awake, without opening his eyes, and threw off the phlegm, which was received in a gold basin as before. At that instant the seven bands of singers joined their voices to the sounds of oboes, fifes, flutes, and other instruments, forming a very agreeable concert. Abu Hassan was in great surprise to hear the delightful harmony, but when he opened his eyes and saw the ladies and officers about him, whom he thought he recognised, his amazement increased. The hall that he was in seemed to be the same he had seen in his first dream, and he observed the same lustres and the same furniture and ornaments. The concert ceased to give the caliph an opportunity of attending to the countenance of his guest and all that he might say in his surprise. The ladies, Mesrur, and all the officers of the chamber waited in profound and respectful silence. Abu Hassan bit his finger, and cried loud enough for the caliph to hear him. Alas! I am fallen again into the same dream and illusion that happened to me a month ago, and must expect again the bastinado and grated cell at the madhouse. Almighty God, added he, I commit myself into the hands of thy divine providence. He was a wicked man that I entertained at my house last night, who has been the cause of this illusion, and the hardships I must again undergo. The base wretch swore to shut the door after him, but did not, and the devil came in, and has turned my brain with this wicked dream of being commander of the faithful, and other phantoms which bewitch my eyes. God confound thee, Satan! and crush thee under some mountain of stones. After these words, Abu Hassan closed his eyes, and remained some time thoughtful and much perplexed. Then, opening them again, and looking about him, cried out a second time with less surprise, and smiling at the various objects before him, Great God, I commit myself into the hands of thy providence. Preserve me from the temptation of Satan. Then, shutting them again, he said, I will go to sleep until Satan leaves me, and returns as he came, were I to wait till noon. They did not give him time to go to sleep again, as he promised himself, for Strength of Hearts, one of the ladies whom he had seen before, approached, and sitting down on the sofa by him, said to him respectfully, Commander of the Faithful, I entreat your majesty to forgive me for taking the liberty to tell you not to go to sleep. Day appears, and it is time to rise. Be gone, Satan, answered Abu Hassan, raising his voice. But looking at the lady, he said, Is it me you call the commander of the faithful? Certainly you take me for somebody else. It is to your majesty I give that title, replied the lady, to whom it belongs as you are sovereign of the world, and I am your most humble slave. Undoubtedly, added she, your majesty means to divert yourself by pretending to have forgotten yourself, 
or this is the effect of some troublesome dream. But if you would but open your eyes, the mists which disturb your imagination would soon be dispelled, and you would find yourself in your own palace, surrounded by your officers and slaves, who all wait your commands, and that your majesty may not be surprised to find yourself in this hall, and not in bed, I beg leave to inform you that you fell so suddenly asleep last night that we were unwilling to awake you to conduit you to your chamber, but laid you carefully upon this sofa. In short, she said to him so many things which appeared probable, that at last he sat up, opened his eyes, and recollected her and all the ladies again. They all approached him, and she who spoke first, resuming the discourse, said, Commander of the faithful, and vicar of the prophet on earth, be not displeased if I acquaint your majesty once more that it is time to rise, for day appears. You are very troublesome and importunate, replied Abu Hassan, rubbing his eyes. I am not the commander of the faithful, but Abu Hassan. I know it well, and you shall not persuade me otherwise. We do not know that Abu Hassan your majesty speaks of, nor desire to know him, answered the lady. But we know you to be the commander of the believers, and you cannot persuade us to the contrary. Abu Hassan, looking about, and finding himself in the same hall, attributed all he saw and heard to such a dream as he had had before, and greatly feared the dreadful consequences. Allah have mercy on me, said he, lifting up his hands and eyes like a man who knew not where he was. I commit myself into his hands. I cannot doubt, after what I have seen, but that the devil who came into my chamber possesses me, and fills my imagination full of all these visions. The caliph, who saw him all the time, and heard these exclamations, began to shake so heartily that he had much difficulty to forbear bursting into loud laughter. Abu Hassan laying himself down again and shutting his eyes, the same lady said, Commander of the faithful, since your majesty does not rise, after we have, according to our duty, informed you it is day, and the dispatch of business requires your presence, we shall use the liberty you give us in such cases. Then, taking him by one arm, and calling to one of the other ladies to do the same by the other, they lifted him up and carried him into the middle of the hall, where they seated him, and all taking hands, danced and skipped round him, while the music played and sounded loudly in his ears. Abu Hassan was in inexpressible perplexity, and exclaimed, What? Am I indeed caliph and commander of the faithful? And in his uncertainty would have said more, but the music was so loud that he could not be heard. At last he made a sign to String of Pearls and Morning Star, two of the ladies who were dancing, that he wanted to speak with them, upon which they forbore and went to him. Do not lie now, said he, but tell me truly who I am. Commander of the faithful, replied Morning Star, your majesty means either to surprise us by asking this question, as if you did not know that you are commander of the faithful, and vicar on earth of the prophet of God, master of both worlds, that whereon we now are, and that to come after death, or else you must have had some extraordinary dream that has made you forget who you are, which may well be, considering that your majesty has slept longer than ordinary. However, if you will give me leave, I will refresh your memory with what passed yesterday. She then told him how he went to council, punished the imam and the four old men, and had sent a present by his grand vizier of a thousand pieces of gold to the mother of one Abu Hassan. What he did in the inner part of the palace, and what passed at the three meals which he took in the three halls, adding, In the fourth, your majesty did us the honour to make us sit down by you, to hear our songs, and received wine from our hands, until your majesty fell asleep, as strength of hearts has told you. From that time, your majesty has continued, contrary to custom, in a sound sleep until now. 
strength of hearts, all your other slaves, and the officers present, can confirm what I say, and it is now time you should go to prayers. Very well, replied Abu Hassan, shaking his head. You would have me believe all this, but I tell you, you are all fools, or mad, and that is great pity, for you are very handsome. Since I saw you, I have been at home, where I used my mother so ill that they sent me to a madhouse, and kept me there three weeks against my will, beat me unmercifully every day, and yet you would make me believe all this to be a dream. Commander of the faithful, answered Morning Star, you are mistaken. We are ready to swear by all your majesty holds most dear, that all you relate can be only a dream. You have never stirred out of this hall since yesterday, but slept here all night. The confidence with which the lady assured Abu Hassan that all she said was truth, and that he had never been out of the hall since that time, bewildered his senses so that he was at a loss what to believe. Oh, heaven, said he to himself, am I Abu Hassan or the commander of the faithful? Almighty heaven, enlighten my understanding and inform me of the truth that I may know what to trust. He then uncovered his shoulders and showed the ladies the livid wheels of the blows he had received. Look, said he, judge whether these strokes could come to me in a dream or when I was asleep. For my part, I can affirm that they were real blows. I feel the smart of them yet, and that is a testimonial there is no room to doubt. Now, if I received these strokes in my sleep, it is the most extraordinary thing in the world, and surpasses my comprehension. In this uncertainty, Abu Hassan called to one of the officers that stood near him. Come hither, said he, and bite the tip of my ear, that I may know whether I am asleep or awake. The officer obeyed, and bit so hard that he made him cry out loudly with the pain. The music struck up at the same time, and the officers and ladies all began to sing, dance, and skip about Abu Hassan, and made such a noise that he was in a perfect ecstasy, and played a thousand ridiculous pranks. He threw off his caliph's habit and his turban, jumped up in his shirt and drawers, and taking hold of two of the ladies' hands, began singing, jumping, and cutting capers, so that the caliph could not contain himself, but burst into such violent laughter, that he fell backwards, and was heard above the noise of all the musicians. He was so long before he could check himself, that it had like to have been fatal. At last he got up, opened the lattice, and putting out his head, cried, Abu Hassan, Abu Hassan, have you a mind to kill me with laughing? As soon as the caliph's voice was heard, everybody was silent, and Abu Hassan among the rest, who, turning his head to see from whence the voice came, knew the caliph, and in him recognized the Mosul merchant, but was not in the least daunted. On the contrary, he became convinced that he was awake, and that all that had happened to him had been real and not a dream. He entered into the caliph's pleasantry. Ha <laughs> ha, said he, looking at him with good assurance. You are a merchant of Mosul, and complain that I would kill you. You have been the occasion of my using my mother so ill, and of my being sent to a madhouse. It was you who treated the imam and the four sheikhs in the manner they were used, and not me. I wash my hands of it. It is you who have been the cause of all my disorders and sufferings. In short, you are the aggressor, and I the injured person. Indeed you are in the right, Abu Hassan, answered the caliph, laughing all the while. But to comfort you, and make amends for all your troubles, I call heaven to witness I am ready and willing to make you what reparation you please to ask. After these words, he came out of the closet into the hall, ordered one of his most magnificent habits to be brought, commanded the ladies to dress Abu Hassan in it, and when they had done, he said, embracing him, Thou art my brother, ask what thou wilt, and thou shalt have it. Commander of the faithful, replied Abu Hassan, I beg of your majesty to do me the favour to tell me what you did to disturb my brain in this manner, 
and what was your design? For it is a thing of the greatest importance for me to know, that I may perfectly recover my senses. The caliph was ready to give him this satisfaction, and said, First, you are to know that I often disguise myself, and particularly at night, to observe if all goes right in Baghdad. And as I wish to know what passes in its environs, I set apart the first day of every month to make an excursion, sometimes on one side, sometimes on another, and always return by the bridge. The evening that you invited me to supper, I was beginning my rounds, and in our conversation you told me that the only thing you wished for was to be caliph for four and twenty hours, to punish the imam of your mosque and his four counsellors. I fancied that this desire of yours would afford me diversion, and thought immediately how I might procure you the satisfaction you wished. I had about me a certain powder, which immediately throws the person who takes it into a sound sleep for a certain time. I put a dose of it, without being perceived by you, into the last glass I presented to you, upon which you fell fast asleep, and I ordered my slave to carry you to my palace, and came away without shutting the door. I have no occasion to repeat what happened when you awoke, nor during the whole day till evening, but after you had been regaled by my orders, one of the ladies put another dose of the same powder into a glass she gave you. You fell asleep as before, and the same slave carried you home, and left the door open. You have told me all that happened to you afterwards. I never imagined that you could have suffered so much as you have done. But, as I have a great regard for you, I will do everything to comfort you, and make you forget all your sufferings. Think of what I can do to serve you, and ask me boldly what you wish. Commander of the Faithful, replied Abu Hassan, how great soever my tortures may have been, they are all blotted out of my remembrance, since I understand my sovereign lord and master had a share in them. I doubt not in the least of your majesty's bounty, but as interest never governed me, and you give me liberty to ask a favour, I beg that it may be that of having access to your person, to enjoy the happiness of admiring all my lifetime your virtues. This proof of disinterestedness in Abu Hassan confirmed the esteem the caliph had entertained for him. I am pleased with your request, said he, and grant you free access to my person at all times and all hours. At the same time, he assigned him an apartment in the palace, and in regard to his pension, told him that he would not have him apply to his treasurer, but come always to him for an order upon him and immediately commanded his private treasurer to give him a purse containing a thousand pieces of gold. Abu Hassan made a low prostration, and the caliph left him to go to council. Abu Hassan took this opportunity to go and inform his mother of his good fortune, and that what had happened was not a dream, for that he had actually been caliph, had acted as such, and received all the honours, and that she had no reason to doubt of it, since he had this confirmed by the caliph himself. It was not long before this story of Abu Hassan was spread throughout Baghdad, and carried into all the provinces, both far and near, without the omission of a single circumstance. The new favourite, Abu Hassan, was always with the caliph, for, as he was a man of a pleasant temper, and created mirth wherever he went by his wit and drollery, the caliph formed no party of diversion without him, and sometimes carried him to visit his consort Zobeida, to whom he had related his story. Zobeida, who observed that every time he came with the caliph, he had his eyes always fixed upon one of her slaves, called Nujatul Audat, resolved to tell the caliph of it. Commander of the faithful, said she one day, you do not observe that every time Abu Hassan attends you in your visits to me, he never keeps his eyes off Nujatul Audat, and makes her blush, which is almost a certain sign that she entertains no aversion for him. If you approve of it, we will make a match between them. Madam, replied the caliph, you remind me of what I ought to have done before. I know Abu Hassan's opinion respecting marriage from himself, and have always promised him a wife that should please him. 
I am glad you mentioned the circumstance, for I know not how I came to forget it. But it is better that Abu Hassan should follow his own inclination and choose for himself. If Nujatul Audat is not averse to it, we ought not to hesitate upon their marriage. And since they are both present, they have only to say that they consent. Abu Hassan threw himself at the caliph's and Zubaydah's feet to show the sense he had of their goodness, and rising up said, I cannot receive a wife from better hands, but dare not hope that Nujatul Audat will give me her hand as readily as I give her mine. At these words he looked at the princess's slave, who showed by her respectful silence and the sudden blush that arose in her cheeks that she was disposed to obey the caliph and her mistress Zobeda. The marriage was solemnized, and the nuptials celebrated in the palace, with great rejoicings, which lasted several days. Zobeda made her slave considerable presents, and the caliph did the same to Abu Hassan. The bride was conducted to the apartment the caliph had assigned Abu Hassan, who awaited for her with all the impatience of a bridegroom, and received her with the sound of all sorts of instruments, and musicians of both sexes, who made the air echo with their concert. After these feasts and rejoicings, which lasted several days, the newly married couple were left to pursue their loves in peace. Abu Hassan and his spouse were charmed with each other, lived together in perfect union, and seldom were asunder. But when either he paid his respects to the caliph, or she hers to Zobeda, indeed, Nujatul Audat was endued with every qualification capable of gaining Abu Hassan's love and attachment, was just such a wife as he had described to the caliph, and fit to sit at the head of his table. With these dispositions they could not fail to pass their lives agreeably. They kept a good table, covered with the nicest and choicest rarities in season, by an excellent cook, who took upon him to provide everything. Their sideboard was always stored with exquisite wines, placed within their reach when at table, where they enjoyed themselves in an agreeable conversation, and afterwards entertained each other with some pleasantry or other, which made them laugh more or less, as they had in the day met with something to divert them. And in the evenings which they consecrated to mirth, they had generally some slight repast of dried sweetmeats, choice fruits, and cakes, and at each glass invited each other by new songs to drink, and sometimes accompanied their voices with a lute or other instruments which they could both touch. Abu Hassan and Nujatul Audat led this pleasant life unattentive to expense, until at length the caterer, who had dispersed all his and their money for these expenses, brought them in a long bill, in hope of having an advance of cash. They found the amount to be so considerable that all the presents which the caliph and Zubeda had given them at their marriage were but just enough to pay him. This made them reflect seriously on what was past, which, however, was no remedy for the present evil. But they agreed to pay the caterer, and having sent for him, gave him all they owed him without considering the difficulty they should be in immediately after. The caterer went away, highly pleased at receiving so large a sum, though Abu Hassan and his wife were not so well satisfied with seeing the bottom of their purse, but remained a long time silent and very much embarrassed, to find themselves reduced to poverty the very first year of their marriage. Abu Hassan remembered that the caliph, when he took him into the palace, had promised never to let him want, but when he considered how prodigal he had been of his money, was unwilling to expose himself to the shame of letting the caliph know the ill use he had made of his bounty, and that he wanted a supply. Besides, he had made over his patrimony to his mother, when the caliph had received him near his person, and was afraid to apply to her, lest she should discover that he had returned to the same extravagance he had been guilty of after his father's death. His wife, on the other hand, regarded Zobeda's generosity, and the liberty she had given her to marry, as more than a sufficient recompense for her service, and thought she had no right to ask more. Abu Hassan at last broke silence, and looking at his wife said, I see you are in the same embarrassment as myself, and thinking what we must do in this unhappy juncture, 
when our money fails us so unexpectedly. I do not know what your sentiments may be, but mine are, let what will happen, not to retrench our expenses in the least, and I believe you will come into my opinion. The point is, how to support them without stooping to ask the caliph or Zubaydah, and I think I have fallen on the means, but we must assist each other. This discourse of Abu Hassan very much pleased his wife, and gave her some hopes. I was thinking so as well as you, said she, but durst not explain my thoughts, because I do not know how we can help ourselves, and must confess that what you tell me gives me a revival of pleasure. Since you say you have found out a resource, and my assistance is necessary, you need but tell me in what way, and I will do all that lies in my power. I was sure, replied Abu Hassan, that you would not fail me in a business which concerns us both, and therefore I must tell you, this want of money has made me think of a plan which will supply us, at least for a time. It consists in a little trick we must put, I upon the caliph, and you upon Zubaydah, and at which, as I am sure they will both be diverted, it will answer advantageously for us. You and I will both die. Not I, indeed, interrupted Nujatul Audat. You may die by yourself, if you please, but I am not so weary of this life, and whether you are pleased or not, will not die so soon. If you have nothing else to propose, you may die by yourself, for I assure you I shall not join you. You are a woman of such vivacity and wonderful quickness, replied Abu Hassan, that you scarcely give me time to explain my design. Have but a little patience, and you shall find that you will be ready enough to die such a death as I intend, for surely you could not think I meant a real death. Well, said his wife, if it is but a sham death you design, I am at your service, and you may depend on my zeal to second you in this manner of dying. But I must tell you truly, I am very unwilling to die as I apprehended you at first. Be but silent a little, said Abu Hassan, and I will tell you what I promise. I will feign myself dead, and you shall lay me out in the middle of my chamber, with my turban upon my face, my feet towards Mecca, as if ready to be carried out to burial. When you have done this, you must lament and weep bitterly, as is usual in such cases, tear your clothes and hair, or pretend to do it, and go all in tears, with your locks dishevelled, to Zubaydah. The princess will of course inquire the cause of your grief, and when you have told her, with words intermixed with sobs, she will pity you, give you money to defray the expense of my funeral, and a piece of good brocade to cover my body, that my interment may be the more magnificent, and to make you a new dress in the room of that you will have torn. As soon as you return with the money and the brocade, I will rise, lay you in my place, and go and act the same part with the caliph, who I dare say will be as generous to me as Zubaydah will have been to you. Nujatul Audat highly approved the project, and said to Abba Hassan, Come, lose no time, strip to your shirt and drawers, while I prepare a winding sheet. I know how to bury, as well as anybody, for while I was in Zubaydah's service, when any of my fellow slaves died, I had the conducting of the funeral. Abu Hassan did as his wife mentioned, and laid himself on the sheet which she had spread on the carpet in the middle of the room. As soon as he had crossed his arms, his wife wrapped him up, turned his feet towards Mecca, and put a piece of fine muslin and his turban upon his face, so that nothing seemed wanting but to carry him out to be buried. After this she pulled off her headdress, and with tears in her eyes, her hair dishevelled, and seeming to tear it off, with a dismal cry and lamentation, beating her face and breast with all the marks of the most lively grief, ran across the court to Zubaydah's apartments, who, hearing the voice of a person crying very loud, commanded some of her women to see who it was. They returned and told her that it was Nujatul Audat, who was approaching in a deplorable condition. The princess, impatient to know what had happened to her, rose up immediately, and went to meet her at the door of her antechamber. Nujatul Audat played her part to perfection, 
as soon as she saw Zobeda, who held the door open, she redoubled her cries, tore her hair off by handfuls, beat her face and breast, and threw herself at her feet, bathing them with her tears. Zobeda, amazed to see her slave in such extraordinary affliction, asked what had happened, but instead of answering, she continued her sobs, and at last, feigning to strive to check them, said, with words interrupted by sighs, Alas, my most honoured lady and mistress, what greater misfortune could have befallen me than this, which obliges me to throw myself at your majesty's feet? God prolong your days, my most respectable princess, in perfect health, and grant you many happy years. Abu Hassan, poor Abu Hassan, whom you honoured with your esteem, and gave me for a husband, is no more. At these words, Nujatul Aoudat redoubled her tears and sighs, and threw herself again at the princess's feet. Zobeda was extremely concerned at this news. "'Abu Hassan dead?' cried she. "'That agreeable, pleasant man! I did not expect his death so soon. He seemed to promise a long life, and well deserved to enjoy it.' She then also burst into tears, as did all her women, who had been often witnesses of Abu Hassan's pleasantries when the caliph brought him to amuse the princess Zobeda, and altogether continued for some time bewailing his loss. At length the princess Zobeda broke silence. "'Wicked woman!' cried she, addressing herself to the false widow. "'Perhaps you may have occasioned his death. Your ill temper has given him so much vexation that you have at last brought him to his grave.' Nujatul Aoudat seemed much hurt at the reproaches of Zobeda. "'Ah, oh, madam!' cried she. I do not think I ever gave your majesty, while I was your slave, reason to entertain so disadvantageous an opinion of my conduct to a husband who was so dear to me. I should think myself the most wretched of women, if you were persuaded of this. I behaved to Abu Hassan as a wife should do to a husband for whom she has a sincere affection, and I may say, without vanity, that I had for him the same regard he had for me. I am persuaded he would, were he alive, justify me fully to your majesty. But, madam, added she, renewing her tears, his time was come, and that was the only cause of his death. Zobeda, as she had really observed in her slave a uniformly equal temper, mildness, great docility, and zeal for her service, which showed she was rather actuated by inclination than duty, hesitated not to believe her on her word, and ordered her treasurer to fetch a hundred pieces of gold and a piece of rich brocade. The slave soon returned with the purse and piece of brocade, which, by Zobeda's order, she delivered to Nujatul Aoudat, who threw herself again at the princess's feet, and thanked her with great self-satisfaction at finding she had succeeded so well. Go, said Zobeda, Use that brocade to cover the corpse of your husband, and with the money bury him handsomely, as he deserves. Moderate the transport of your afflictions. I will take care of you. As soon as Nujatul Aoudat got out of the princess's presence, she dried up her tears, and returned with joy to Abu Hassan, to give him an account of her good success. When she came home, she burst out laughing on seeing her husband still stretched out in the middle of the floor. She ran to him, bade him rise and see the fruits of his stratagem. He arose and rejoiced with his wife at the sight of the purse and brocade. Unable to contain herself at the success of her artifice, "'Come, husband,' said she, laughing, "'let me act the dead part, and see if you can manage the caliph as well as I have done Zobeda.' "'That is the temper of all women,' replied Abu Hassan, "'who, we may well say, have always the vanity to believe they can do things better than men, "'though at the same time what good they do is by their advice. "'It would be odd indeed if I, who laid this plot myself, could not carry it on as well as you. "'But let us lose no time in idle discourse. "'Lie down in my place, and witness if I do not come off with as much applause.' 
Abu Hassan wrapped up his wife as she had done him, and with his turban unrolled, like a man in the greatest affliction, ran to the caliph, who was holding a private council with Jaafir and other confidential viziers. He presented himself at the door, and the officer, knowing he had free access, opened it. He entered, holding with one hand his handkerchief before his eyes, to hide the feigned tears which trickled down his cheeks, and striking his breast with the other, with exclamations expressing extraordinary grief. The caliph, always used to seeing Abu Hassan with a merry countenance, was very much surprised to behold him in so much distress. He interrupted the business of the council to inquire the cause of his grief. "'Commander of the faithful,' answered Abu Hassan, with repeated sighs and sobs, "'God preserve your majesty on the throne, which you fill so gloriously. A greater calamity could not have befallen me than what I now lament. Alas, Nujatul Awdat, whom you and your bounty gave me for a wife, to gladden my existence, alas!' At this exclamation, Abu Hassan pretended to have his heart so full that he could not utter more, but poured forth a flood of tears. The caliph, who now understood that Abu Hassan came to tell him of the death of his wife, seemed much concerned, and said to him, with an air which showed how much he regretted her loss, "'God be merciful to her. She was a good slave, and we gave her to you with an intention to make you happy. She deserved a longer life.' The tears then ran down his face, so that he was obliged to pull out his handkerchief to wipe them off. The grief of Abu Hassan and the tears of the caliph excited those of Jaffir and the other viziers. They bewailed the death of Nujatul Awdat, who on her part was only impatient to hear how Abu Hassan succeeded. The caliph had the same suspicion of the husband that Zubaydah had of the wife, and imagined that he had occasioned her death. Wretch, said he in a tone of indignation, have not you been the cause of your wife's death by your ill-treatment of her? You ought at least to have had some regard for the princess, my consort, who loved her more than the rest of her slaves, yet consented to give her to you. What a return for her kindness! Commander of the faithful, replied Abu Hassan, affecting to weep more bitterly than before, can your majesty for a moment suppose that Abu Hassan, whom you have loaded with your favours and kindness, and on whom you have conferred honours he could never have aspired to, can have been capable of such ingratitude? I loved Nujatul Awdat, my wife, as much on these accounts as for the many good qualities she possessed, and which drew from me all the attachment, tenderness, and love she deserved. But, my lord, added he, she was to die, and God would no longer suffer me to enjoy a happiness for which I was indebted to your majesty and your beloved consort. Abu Hassan dissembled so well that the caliph, who had never heard how extravagantly he and his wife had lived, no longer doubting his sincerity, ordered his treasurer, who was present, to give Abu Hassan a purse of a hundred pieces of gold and a piece of brocade. Abu Hassan immediately cast himself at the caliph's feet and thanked him for his present. "'Follow the treasurer,' said the monarch. "'Throw the brocade over the corpse, and with the money show the last testimony of thy love for thy wife.' Abu Hassan made no reply to these obliging words of the caliph, but retiring with a low prostration, followed the treasurer, and as soon as he had got the purse and piece of brocade, went home well pleased with having found out so quick and easy a way of supplying the necessity which had given him so much uneasiness. Nujatul Awdat, weary with lying so long in one posture, waited not till Abu Hassan bade her rise, but as soon as she heard the door open, sprang up, ran to her husband, and asked him if he had imposed on the caliph as cleverly as she had done on Zobeda. "'You see,' said he, showing her the stuff and shaking the purse, that I can act a sorrowful husband for a living wife as well as you can a weeping widow for a husband not dead. Abu Hassan, however, was not without his fears that this double plot might be attended with some ill consequences. 
he thought it would not be amiss to put his wife on her guard as to what might happen, that they might act in concert. For, added he, the better we succeed in embarrassing the caliph and Zubeda, the more they will be pleased at last, and perhaps may show their satisfaction by greater liberality. This last consideration induced them to carry on their stratagem farther. The caliph, though he had important affairs to decide, was so impatient to condole with the princess on the death of her slave, that he rose up as soon as Abu Hassan was gone, and put off the council to another day. "'Follow me,' said he to Mesrour, who always attended him wherever he went, and was in all his councils. "'Let us go and share with the princess the grief which the death of her slave, Nujatul Aoudat, must have occasioned.' Accordingly, they went to Zubeda's apartment, whom the caliph found sitting on a sofa, much afflicted and still in tears. "'Madam,' said the caliph, going up to her, "'it is unnecessary to tell you how much I partake with you in your affliction, "'since you must be sensible that what gives you pleasure or trouble has the same effect on me. "'But we are all mortal, and must surrender up to God that life he has given us when he requires it. "'Nujatul Aoudat, your faithful slave, was endued with qualifications that deserved your esteem.' and I cannot but approve your expressing it after her death. But consider, all your grief will not restore her to life. Therefore, madam, if you love me, and will take my advice, be comforted for this loss, take care of a life which you know is precious to me, and constitutes all the happiness of mine. If the princess was charmed with these tender sentiments which the caliph expressed in his compliments, she was amazed to hear of Nujatul Aoudat's death. This news threw her into such astonishment that she was not able to return an answer for some time. At last recovering, she replied with an air expressive of surprise, Commander of the Faithful, I am very sensible of all your tender sentiments, but give me leave to say, I cannot comprehend the news you tell me of the death of my slave, who is in perfect health. My affliction is for the death of Abu Hassan, her husband, your favourite, whom I esteemed as much for the regard you had for him, as his having so often diverted me agreeably, and for whom I had as great a value as yourself. But the little concern you show for his death, and your so soon forgetting a man in whose company you have so often told me you took so much pleasure, surprises me, and this insensibility seems the greater from the deception you would put upon me in changing his death for that of my slave. End of section 14 Section 15 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3 Translated by Jonathan Scott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry the Story of Abul Hassan, or The Sleeper Awakened, Part 5 The caliph, who thought that he was perfectly well informed of the death of the slave, and had just reason to believe so, because he had both seen and heard Abu Hassan, laughed and shrugged up his shoulders to hear Zubaydah talk in this manner. Mesrur, said he to the eunuch, what do you think of the princess's discourse? Do not women sometimes lose their senses, for you have heard and seen all as well as myself. Then, turning to Zobeda, Madam, said he, shed no more tears for Abu Hassan, for I can assure you he is well. But rather, bewail the death of your dear slave. It is not many moments since her husband came in the most inexpressible affliction to tell me of the death of his wife. I gave him a purse of a hundred pieces of gold and a piece of brocade to comfort him and bury her, and Mesrur, who was present, can tell you the same. The princess took this discourse of the caliph's to be all a jest, and thought he had a mind to impose upon her. Commander of the faithful, replied she, though you are used to banter, I must tell you this is not a proper time for pleasantry. What I tell you is very serious. I do not talk of my slave's death, but of Abu Hassan's, her husband, 
whose fate I bewail, and so ought you to. Madam, said the caliph, putting on a grave countenance, I tell you without raillery that you are deceived. Nujatul Audat is dead, and Abu Hassan is alive, and in perfect health. Zobeda was much piqued at this dry answer of the caliph. Commander of the faithful, replied she smartly, God preserve you from continuing longer in this mistake. Surely you would make me think your mind is not as usual. Give me leave to repeat to you once more that it is Abu Hassan who is dead, and that my slave, Nujatul Audat, his widow, is living. It is not an hour since she went from hence. She came here in so disconsolate a state that the sight of her was enough to have drawn tears from my eyes if she had not told me her affliction. All my women who wept with me can bear me witness, and tell you also that I made her a present of a hundred pieces of gold and a piece of brocade. The grief which you found me in was on account of the death of her husband, and just at the instant you entered I was going to send you a compliment of condolence. At these words of Zobeda, the caliph cried out in a fit of laughter, This, madam, is a strange piece of obstinacy. But, continued he seriously, you may depend upon Nujatul Audat's being dead. I tell you no, sir, replied Zobeda sharply. It is Abu Hassan that is dead, and you shall never make me believe otherwise. Upon this, the caliph's anger rose in his countenance. He seated himself on the sofa at some distance from the princess, and speaking to Mizrur said, Go immediately, see which it is, and bring me word, for though I am certain that it is Nujatul Audat, I would rather take this method than be any longer obstinately positive about the matter, though of its certainty I am perfectly satisfied. No sooner had the caliph commanded him than Mizrur was gone. You will see continued he, addressing himself to Zubeda, in a moment, which of us is right? For my part, replied Zubeda, I know very well that I am in the right, and you will find it to be Abu Hassan. And for myself, returned the caliph, I am so sure that it is Nujatul Audat, that I will lay you what wager you please that Abu Hassan is well. Do not think to come off so, said Zubeda. I accept your wager, and I am so well persuaded of his death, that I would willingly lay the thing dearest to me in the world against what you will, though it were of less value. You know what I have in my disposal, and what I value most. Propose the bet, and I will stand to it. Since it is so, replied the caliph, I will lay my garden of pleasures against your palace of paintings, though the one is worth much more than the other. Is the question at present, replied Zobeda, if your garden is more valuable than my palace? That is not the point. You have made choice of what you thought fit belonging to me, as an equivalent against what you lay. I accept the wager, and that I will abide by it, I take God to witness. The caliph took the same oath, and both waited Mizrur's return. While the caliph and Zubeda were disputing so earnestly and with so much warmth, Abu Hassan, who foresaw their difference, was very attentive to whatever might happen. As soon as he perceived Mizrur through a window, at which he sat talking with his wife, and observed that he was coming directly to their apartment, he guessed his commission, and bade his wife make haste to act the dead part once more, as they had agreed, without loss of time. But they were so pressed that Abu Hassan had much ado to wrap up his wife and lay the piece of brocade which the caliph had given him upon her, before Mizrur reached the house. This done, he opened the door of his apartment, and with a melancholy, dejected countenance, and his handkerchief before his eyes, went and sat down at the head of the pretended deceased. By the time he was seated, Mizrur came into the room. The dismal sight which met his eyes gave him a secret joy on account of the errand the caliph had sent him on. Abu Hassan rose up to meet him, and, kissing his hand out of respect, said, sighing and sobbing, You see me under the greatest calamity that ever could have befallen me, 
the death of my dear wife, Nujatul Aoudat, whom you honoured with your favours. Mazur, affected by this discourse, could not refuse some tears to the memory of the deceased. He lifted up the cloth a little at the head, and peeping under it, let it down again, and said with a deep sigh, There is no other God but Allah. We must all submit to his will, and every creature must return to him. Nujatul Aoudat, my good sister, added he, sighing, thy days have been few. God have mercy on thee. Then turning to Abu Hassan, who was all the time in tears, we may well say, added he, that women sometimes have whims, and lose their senses in a most unpardonable manner. For Zobeda, good mistress as she is, is in that situation at present. She will maintain to the caliph that you are dead, and not your wife, and whatever the caliph can say to the contrary, he cannot persuade her otherwise. He called me to witness and confirm this truth, for you know I was present when you came and told him the sorrowful news. But all signifies nothing. They are both positive, and the caliph, to convince Zobeda, has sent me to know the truth. But I fear I shall not be believed, for when women once take up a thing, they are not to be beaten out of it. God keep the commander of the faithful in the possession and right use of his senses, replied Abu Hassan, still sighing and weeping. You see how it is, and that I have not imposed upon his majesty. And I wish to heaven, continued he, to dissemble the better, that I had no occasion to have told him the melancholy and afflicting news. Alas, I cannot enough express my irreparable loss. That is true, replied Mesrour, and I can assure you I take a great share in your affliction. But you must be comforted, and not abandon yourself to your grief. I leave you with reluctance to return to the caliph, but I beg the favour of you not to bury the corpse till I come again, for I will assist at the interment, and accompany it with my prayers. Mesrour went to give an account of his visit. Abu Hassan attended him to the door, told him he did not deserve the honour he intended him, and, for fear Mesrour should return to say something else, followed him with his eyes for some time, and when he saw him at a distance, returned to his wife and released her. "'This is already,' said he, "'a new scene of mirth, but I fancy it will not be the last, for certainly the Princess Zobeda will not believe Mesrour, but will laugh at him, since she has too substantial a reason to the contrary. Therefore, we must expect some new event. While Abu Hassan was talking thus, Nujatul Aoudat had time to put on her clothes again, and both went and sat down on a sofa opposite to the window, where they could see all that passed. In the meantime, Mesrur reached Zobeda's apartment, and going into her closet laughing, clapped his hands like one who had something very agreeable to tell. The caliph, naturally impatient, and piqued a little at the princess's contradiction. As soon as he saw Mesrour, "'Vile slave!' said he. "'Is this a time to laugh? Why do not you tell me which is dead, the husband or the wife?' "'Commander of the faithful,' answered Mesrour, putting on a serious countenance. "'It is Nujatul Aoudat who is dead.' for the loss of whom Abu Hassan is as much afflicted as when he appeared before your majesty. The caliph, not giving him time to pursue his story, interrupted him and cried out, laughing heartily, Good news! Zubeda, your mistress, was a moment ago possessed of the palace of paintings, and now it is mine. She staked it against my garden of pleasures, since you went. Therefore you could not have done me greater pleasure. I will take care to reward you, but give me a true account of what you saw. Commander of the faithful, said Mesrour, when I came to Abu Hassan's apartment, I found the door open, and he was bewailing the death of his wife. He sat at the head of the deceased, who was laid out in the middle of the room, with her feet towards Mecca, and was covered with the piece of brocade which your majesty presented to Abu Hassan. After I had expressed the share I took in his grief, I went and lifted up the pall at the head. 
and knew Nujatul Aoudat, though her face was much swelled and changed. I exhorted Abu Hassan in the best manner I could to be comforted, and when I came away told him I would attend at his wife's funeral, and desired him not to remove the corpse till I came. This is all I can tell your majesty. I ask no more, said the caliph, laughing heartily, and I am well satisfied with your exactness. Then, addressing himself to Zobeda, Well, madam, said he, have you yet anything to say against so certain a truth? Will you still believe that Nujatul Aoudat is alive, and that Abu Hassan is dead? And will you not own that you have lost your wager? How, sir, replied Zobeda, who would not believe one word Mesrour said, do you think that I regard that impertinent fellow of a slave who knows not what he says? I am not blind or mad. With these eyes I saw Nujatul Aoudat in the greatest affliction. I spoke to her myself, and she told me that her husband was dead. Madam, replied Mesrour, I swear to you by your own life and that of the commander of the faithful, which are both dear to me, that Nujatul Aoudat is dead, and Abu Hassan is living. Thou liest, base, despicable slave! said Zubeda in a rage, and I will confound thee immediately. Clapping her hands together, she called her women, who all approached. Come hither, said the princess to them, and speak the truth. Who was that who came and spoke with me a little before the caliph entered? The women all answered that it was poor afflicted Nujatul Aoudat. And what, added she, addressing herself to her treasurer, did I order you to give her? Madam, answered the treasurer, I gave Nujatul Aoudat, by your orders, a purse of a hundred pieces of gold and a piece of brocade, which she carried away with her. Well then, sorry slave, said Zubeda to Mesrour in passion, what have you to say to all this? Whom do you think now I ought to believe? You, or my treasurer, my women, and myself? Mesrour did not want for arguments to contradict the princess, but, as he was afraid of provoking her too much, chose rather to be silent, though he was satisfied that the wife was dead and not the husband. During the whole of this dispute between Zobeda and Mesrour, the caliph, who heard the evidence on both sides, and was persuaded of the contrary of what the princess asserted, because he had himself seen and spoken to Abu Hassan, and from what Mesrour had told him, laughed heartily to see Zobeda so exasperated. Madam, said he to her, once more I repeat that I know not who was the author of that saying that women sometimes lose their wits but I am sure you make it good. Mesrour has just come from Abu Hassan's, and tells you that he saw Nujatul Aoudat lying dead in the middle of the room, Abu Hassan alive and sitting by her. And yet you will not believe this evidence, which nobody can reasonably refuse. I cannot comprehend this conduit. Zubeda would not hear the caliph. Pardon me, commander of the faithful, replied she, if I suspect you. I see that you have contrived with Mesrour to vex me and to try my patience, and as I perceive that this report was concerted between you, I beg leave to send a person to Abu Hassan's to know whether or not I am in the wrong. The caliph consented, and the princess charged with this important commission an old nurse who had lived with her from her infancy. Hark you, nurse, said she, you see my dispute with the commander of the faithful and Mesrour. I need tell you no more. Go to Abu Hassan's, or rather to Nujatul Aoudat's, for Abu Hassan is dead, and clear up this matter for me. If you bring me good news, a handsome present is your reward. Make haste and return immediately. The nurse set out, to the great joy of the caliph, who was delighted to see Zobeda in this embarrassment. But Mesrour, extremely mortified to find the princess so angry with him, did all he could to appease her, and to make her and the caliph both satisfied with him. 
he was overjoyed when zobeida sent the nurse because he was persuaded that the report she must make would agree with his justify him and restore him to her favour in the meantime abu hassan who watched at the window perceived the nurse at a distance and guessing that she was sent by zobeida called his wife and told her that the princess's nurse was coming to know the truth therefore said he make haste and lay me out accordingly nujatul aoudat covered him with the brocade zobeida had given her and put his turban upon his face the nurse eager to acquit herself of her commission hobbled as fast as age would allow her and entering the room perceived nujatul aoudat in tears her hair dishevelled and seated at the head of her husband beating her breast with all the expressions of violent grief the good old nurse went directly to the false widow my dear nujatul aoudat said she with a sorrowful countenance i come not to interrupt your grief and tears for a husband whom you loved so tenderly ah good mother replied the counterfeit widow you see my misfortune and how unhappy i am from the loss of my beloved abu hassan abu hassan my dear husband cried she what have i done that you should leave me so soon have i not always preferred your will to my own alas what will become of poor nujatul aoudat this black-faced mesrour cried the nurse lifting up her hands deserves to be punished for having caused so great a difference between my good mistress and the commander of the faithful by the falsehood he has told them daughter continued she that villain mesrour has asserted with inconceivable impudence before our good mistress that you were dead and abu hassan was alive alas my good mother cried nujatul aoudat i wish to heaven that it was true i should not be in this sorrowful state nor bewail a husband so dear to me at these words she wept afresh and with redoubled tears and cries feigned the deepest sorrow the nurse was so much moved by her tears that she sat down by her and cried too then gently lifting up the turban and cloth looked at the face of the corpse ah poor abu hassan she cried covering his face again god have mercy upon thee adieu child said she to nujatul aoudat if i could stay longer with you i would with all my heart but i am obliged to return immediately to deliver my mistress from the uneasiness that black villain has occasioned her by his impudent lie assuring her with an oath that you were dead as soon as the nurse was gone nujatul aoudat wiped her eyes and released abu hassan they both went and sat down on a sofa against the window expecting what would be the end of this stratagem and to be ready to act according as circumstances might require the nurse in the meantime made all the haste she could to go to zobeida the pleasure of carrying the princess news favourable to her wager but still more the hopes of a good reward added wings to her feet and running into the princess's closet quite out of breath she gave her a true account of all she had seen zobeida hearkened to the old woman's relation with a most sensible pleasure and when she had done said with a tone which showed triumph at having as she supposed won her wager repeat it once more before the caliph who looks upon us all to be fools who would make us believe we have no sense of religion nor fear of god and tell your story to that wicked black slave who had the insolence to assert a wilful falsehood mesrour who expected the nurse's report would prove favourable on his side was much mortified to find it so much the contrary and so vexed at the anger zobeida expressed against him for a thing which he thought himself surer of than anybody that he was glad of an opportunity of speaking his mind freely to the old woman which he durst not do to the princess old toothless said he to the nurse you are a liar and there is no truth in what you say for i saw with my own eyes nujatul aoudat laid out in the middle of the room 
you are a notorious liar yourself replied the nurse with an insulting air to dare maintain so great a falsity before my face who am just come from seeing abu hassan dead laid out and have left his wife alive i am not an impostor replied mesrour it is you who endeavour to lead us all into error what impudence said the nurse to dare tell me i lie in the presence of their majesties when i saw just now with my own eyes what i have had the honour to tell them indeed nurse answered mesrour again you had better hold your tongue for you certainly don't Zobeda, who could no longer endure this want of respect in Mesrour, who, without any regard to her, treated her nurse so injuriously in her presence, without giving the old lady time to reply to so gross an affront, said to the caliph, Commander of the faithful, I demand justice for this insolence to us both. She was so enraged she could say no more, but burst into tears. The caliph, who had heard all the dispute, thought it very intricate he mused some time and could not tell what to think of so many contradictions the princess on her part as well as mesrour the nurse and all the women slaves who were present were as much puzzled and remained silent at last the caliph addressing himself to zobeida said i see we are all liars myself first then you mesrour and you nurse or at least it seems not one can be believed more than the other therefore let us go ourselves to examine the truth for i can see no other way to clear up these doubts so saying the caliph arose the princess followed him and mesrour went before to open the doors commander of the faithful said he i am overjoyed that your majesty has taken this course and shall be much more when I shall make it plainly appear to the nurse, not that she dotes, since the expression is unfortunately displeasing to my good mistress, but that her report is not true. The nurse wanted not a reply. Hold your tongue, black face, said she. You dote yourself. Zobeda, who was much provoked at Mesrour, could not bear to hear him attack her nurse again without taking her part vile slave said she say what you will i maintain my nurse speaks the truth and look upon you as a mere liar madam replied mesrour if nurse is so very certain that nujatul aoudat is alive and abu hassan dead i will lay her what she dares of it the nurse was as ready as he i dare said she take you at your word let us see if you dare unsay it. Mesrour stood to his word, and they laid a piece of gold brocade with silver flowers before the caliph and the princess. The apartment from which the caliph and Zubeda set out, though distant from Abu Hassan's, was nevertheless just opposite, so that he perceived them coming, and told his wife that he was much mistaken if the caliph and Zubeda, preceded by Mesrour, and followed by a great number of women were not about to do them the honour of a visit. She looked through a lattice and saw them, seemed frightened, and cried out, What shall we do? We are ruined. Fear nothing, replied Abu Hassan. Have you forgotten already what we agreed on? We will both feign ourselves dead, and you shall see all will go well. At the slow rate they are coming, we shall be ready before they reach the door. Accordingly, Abu Hassan and his wife wrapped up and covered themselves with the pieces of brocade and waited patiently for their visitors. Mesrour, who came first, opened the door and the caliph and Zubeda, followed by their attendants, entered the room, but were struck with horror and stood motionless at the spectacle which presented itself to their view, not knowing what to think. At length, Zubeda, breaking silence, said to the caliph, alas they are both dead you have done much continued she looking at the caliph and mesrour to endeavour to make me believe that my dear slave was dead and i find it is true grief at the loss of her husband has certainly killed her 
Say rather, madam, answered the caliph, prepossessed to the contrary, that Nurjatul died first. The afflicted Abu Hassan sunk under his grief, and could not survive his dear wife. You ought, therefore, to confess that you have lost your wager, and that your palace of paintings is mine. Hold there, answered Zubayda, warmed at being contradicted by the caliph. I will maintain you have lost your garden of pleasures. Abu Hassan died first, since my nurse told you as well as me that she saw her alive, and weeping for the death of her husband. The dispute of the caliph and Zubayda brought on another between Mizrur and the nurse, who had wagered as well as they. Each affirmed to have won, and at length they proceeded to abuse each other very grossly. At last the caliph, reflecting on what had passed, began to think that Zubayda had as much reason as himself to maintain that she had won. In this embarrassment of not being able to find out the truth, he advanced towards the corpses, and sat down at the head, searching for some expedient that might gain him the victory over Zubayda. "'I swear,' cried he presently after, "'by the holy name of God, that I will give a thousand pieces of gold to him who can tell me which of these two died first. No sooner were these words out of the caliph's mouth than he heard a voice under Abu Hassan's piece of brocade say, Commander of the faithful, I died first. Give me the thousand pieces of gold. At the same instant, Abu Hassan threw off the piece of brocade and springing up, prostrated himself at his feet while his wife did the same to Zubayda, keeping on her piece of brocade out of decency. The princess at first shrieked out, but recovering herself, expressed great joy to see her dear slave rise again, just when she was almost inconsolable at having seen her dead. Ah, oh, wicked Nujatul Awdat, cried she. What have I suffered for your sake? However, I forgive you from my heart since you are not dead. The caliph was not so much surprised when he heard Abu Hassan's voice, but thought he should have died with laughing at this unravelling of the mystery, and to hear Abu Hassan ask so seriously for the thousand pieces of gold. What, Abu Hassan, said he, continuing to laugh aloud, hast thou conspired against my life to kill me a second time with laughing? How came this thought into your head to surprise Zubayda and me thus, when we least thought of such a trick? Commander of the faithful, replied Abu Hassan, I will declare to your majesty the whole truth, without the least reserve. Your majesty knows that I always loved to eat and drink well, and the wife you gave me rather increased than restrained this propensity. With these dispositions your majesty may easily suppose we might spend a good estate. And, to make short of my story, we were not sparing of what your majesty so generously gave us. This morning, accounting with our caterer, who took care to provide everything for us, and paying what we owed him, we found we had nothing left. Then reflections on what was past, and resolutions to manage better for the future, crowded into our thoughts. We formed a thousand projects, all of which we rejected. At last, the shame of seeing ourselves reduced to so low a condition, and not daring to tell your majesty, made us contrive this stratagem to relieve our necessities, and to divert you, which we hope your majesty will be pleased to pardon. The caliph was satisfied with Abu Hassan's sincerity, and Zubayda, who had till now been very seriously, began to laugh at the thought of Abu Hassan's scheme. The caliph, who had not ceased laughing at the singularity of the adventure, rising, said to Abu Hassan and his wife, Follow me, I will give you the thousand pieces of gold I promised, for joy to find you are not dead. Zobeda desired him to let her make her slave a present of the same sum, for the same reason. By this means, Abu Hassan and his wife Nujatul al-Dat preserved the favour of the caliph Harun al-Rashid, and the princess Zubayda, and by their liberalities were enabled to pursue their pleasures. End of section 15 End of the story of Abu Hassan, or the Sleeper Awakened
Chapter 16 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Story of Allah ad or The Wonderful Lamp, Part 1. In the capital of one of the large and rich provinces of the kingdom of China, the name of which I do not recollect, there lived a tailor named Mustafa, who was so poor that he could hardly, by his daily labour, maintain himself and his family, which consisted of a wife and son. His son, who was called Allah ad had been brought up in a very careless and idle manner, and by that means had contracted many vicious habits. He was wicked, obstinate, and disobedient to his father and mother, who, when he grew up, could not keep him within doors. He was in the habit of going out early in the morning, and would stay out all day, playing in the streets and public places with idle children of his own age. When he was old enough to learn a trade, his father, not being able to put him out to any other, took him into his own shop, and taught him how to use his needle. But neither fair words, nor the fear of chastisement, were capable of fixing his lively genius. All his father's endeavours to keep him to his work were in vain, for no sooner was his back turned than he was gone for that day. Mustafa chastised him, but Allah ad was incorrigible, and his father, to his great relief, was forced to abandon him to his idleness, and was so much troubled at not being able to reclaim him that it threw him into a fit of sickness, of which he died in a few months. The mother, finding that her son would not follow his father's business, shut up the shop, sold off the implements of trade, and with the money she received for them, and what she could get by spinning cotton, thought to maintain herself and her son. Allah ad who was now no longer restrained by the fear of a father, and who cared so little for his mother, that whenever she chid him he would abuse her, gave himself entirely over to his idle habits, and was never out of the streets from his companions. This course he followed till he was fifteen years old, without giving his mind to any useful pursuit or the least reflection on what would become of him. In this situation, as he was one day playing, according to custom, in the street, with his vagabond associates, a stranger passing by stood to observe him. This stranger was a sorcerer, called by the writer of this story the African magician. He was a native of Africa, and had been but two days arrived from thence. The African magician who was a good physiognomist, observing in Allah ad Din's countenance something absolutely necessary for the execution of the design he was engaged in, inquired artfully about his family, who he was, and what were his inclinations. And when he had learned all he desired to know, went up to him, and, taking him aside from his comrades, said, "'Child, was not your father called Mustafa the tailor?' "'Yes, sir.' answered the boy, but he has been dead a long time. At these words the African magician threw his arms about Allah ad neck, and kissed him several times with tears in his eyes. Allah ad who observed his tears, asked him what made him weep. Alas, my son, cried the African magician with a sigh, how can I forbear? I am your uncle. Your worthy father was my own brother. I have been many years abroad, and now I am come home with the hopes of seeing him. You tell me he is dead. I assure you, it is a sensible grief to me to be deprived of the comfort I expected. But it is some relief to my affliction, that as far as I can remember him, I knew you at first sight, you are so like him, and I see I am not deceived. Then he asked Allah ad Din, putting his hand into his purse, where his mother lived, and as soon as he had informed him, gave him a handful of small money, saying, Go, my son, to your mother, give my love to her, and tell her that I will visit her to-morrow, if I have time, 
that I may have the satisfaction of seeing where my good brother lived so long, and ended his days. As soon as the African magician left his newly adopted nephew, Alla ad -Din ran to his mother, overjoyed at the money his uncle had given him. Mother, said he, have I an uncle? No, child, replied his mother. You have no uncle by your father's side or mine. I am just now come, said Alla ad -Din, from a man who says he is my uncle by my father's side, assuring me that he is his brother. He cried and kissed me when I told him my father was dead. And to show you that what I tell you is truth, added he, pulling out the money, see what he has given me. He charged me to give his love to you, and to tell you, if he has any time to-morrow, he will come and pay you a visit, that he may see the house my father lived and died in. Indeed, child, replied the mother, your father had a brother, but he has been dead a long time, and I never heard of another. The mother and son talked no more then of the African magician, but the next day Alla ad -Din's uncle found him playing in another part of the town with other children, and, embracing him as before, put two pieces of gold into his hand, and said to him, Carry this child to your mother. Tell her that I will come and see her to-night, and bid her get us something for supper. But first show me the house where you live. After Alla ad -Din had showed the African magician the house, he carried the two pieces of gold to his mother, and when he had told her of his uncle's intention, she went out and bought provisions and considering she wanted various utensils, borrowed them of her neighbours. She spent the whole day in preparing the supper, and at night, when it was ready, said to her son, "'Perhaps your uncle knows not how to find our house. Go and bring him, if you meet with him.' Though Allah ad -Din had showed the magician the house, he was ready to go, when somebody knocked at the door, which he immediately opened and the magician came in, loaded with wine and all sorts of fruits, which he brought for a dessert. After the African magician had given what he brought into Alla ad -Din's hands, he saluted his mother, and desired her to show him the place where his brother Mustafa used to sit on the sofa, and when she had so done, he fell down and kissed it several times, crying out with tears in his eyes, "'My poor brother!' How unhappy am I not to have come soon enough to give you one last embrace. Alla ad -Din's mother desired him to sit down in the same place, but he declined. No, said he, I shall take care how I do that. But give me leave to sit opposite to it, that although I am deprived of the satisfaction of seeing the master of a family so dear to me, I may at least have the pleasure of beholding the place where he used to sit. The widow pressed him no farther, but left him at liberty to sit where he pleased. When the magician had made choice of a place and sat down, he began to enter into discourse with Alla ad -Din's mother. "'My good sister,' said he, "'do not be surprised at your never having seen me all the time you have been married to my brother Mustafa of happy memory. I have been forty years absent from this country, which is my native place, as well as my late brothers, and during that time have travelled into the Indies, Persia, Arabia, Syria, and Egypt, have resided in the finest towns of those countries, and afterwards crossed over into Africa, where I made a longer stay. At last, as it is natural for a man, how distant soever it may be, to remember his native country, relations, and acquaintance, I was desirous to see mine again, and to embrace my dear brother, and finding I had strength enough to undertake so long a journey, I immediately made the necessary preparations and set out. I will not tell you the length of time it took me, all the obstacles I met with, and what fatigues I have endured to come hither, but nothing ever mortified and afflicted me so much, and hearing of my brother's death, for whom I always had a brotherly love and friendship, I observed his features in the face of my nephew, your son, and distinguished him among a number of children with whom he was at play. 
he can tell you how I received the most melancholy news that ever reached my ears. But God be praised for all things. It is a comfort for me to find, as it were, my brother in a son, who has his most remarkable features. The African magician, perceiving that the widow began to weep at the remembrance of her husband, changed the conversation, and turning towards her son, asked him his name. "'I am called Allah ad said he. "'Well, Allah ad replied the magician, "'what business do you follow? Are you of any trade?' At this question the youth hung down his head, and was not a little abashed when his mother answered, "'Allah ad is an idle fellow. His father, when alive, strove all he could to teach him his trade, but could not succeed. And since his death, notwithstanding all I can say to him, he does nothing but idle away his time in the streets, as you saw him, without considering he is no longer a child. And if you do not make him ashamed of it, I despair of his ever coming to any good. He knows that his father left him no fortune, and sees me endeavour to get bread by spinning cotton. For my part, I am resolved one of these days to turn him out of doors, and let him provide for himself. After these words, Allah ad Din's mother burst into tears, and the magician said, This is not well, nephew. You must think of helping yourself, and getting your livelihood. There are many sorts of trades. Consider if you have not an inclination to some of them. Perhaps you do not like your father's, and would prefer another. Come, do not disguise your sentiments from me. I will endeavour to help you. But finding that Allah ad Din returned no answer, If you have no mind, continued he, to learn any handicraft, I will take a shop for you, furnish it with all sorts of fine stuffs and linens, and with the money you make of them, lay in fresh goods, and then you will live in an honourable way. Consult your inclination, and tell me freely what you think of my proposal. You shall always find me ready to keep my word. This plan greatly flattered Allah ad Din, who hated work, but had sense enough to know that such shops were much frequented, and the owners respected. He told the magician he had a greater inclination to that business than to any other, and that he should be much obliged to him for his kindness. "'Since this profession is agreeable to you,' said the African magician, "'I will carry you with me to-morrow, clothe you as handsomely as the best merchants in the city, and afterwards we will think of opening a shop, as I mentioned.' The widow, who never till then could believe that the magician was her husband's brother, no longer doubted after his promises of kindness to her son. She thanked him for his good intentions, and after having exhorted Allah ad Din to render himself worthy of his uncle's favour by good behaviour, served up supper, at which they talked of several indifferent matters, and then the magician, who saw that the night was pretty far advanced, took his leave and retired. He came again the next day, as he had promised, and took Allah ad Din with him to a merchant who sold all sorts of clothes for different ages and ranks, ready-made, and a variety of fine stuffs. He asked to see some that suited Allah ad Din in size, and after choosing a suit for himself which he liked best, and rejecting others which he did not think handsome enough, he bade Allah ad Din choose those he preferred. Allah ad Din, charmed with the liberality of his new uncle, made choice of one, and the magician immediately paid for it. When Allah ad Din found himself so handsomely equipped, he returned his uncle thanks, who promised never to forsake him, but always to take him along with him, which he did to the most frequented places in the city, and particularly where the principal merchants kept their shops. When he brought him into the street where they sold the richest stuffs and finest linens, he said to Allah ad Din, as you are soon to be a merchant, it is proper you should frequent these shops and be acquainted with them. He then showed him the largest and finest mosques, carried him to the khans or inns where the merchants and travellers lodged, and afterwards to the sultan's palace, where he had free access, and at last brought him to his own khan, 
where, meeting with some merchants he had become acquainted with since his arrival, he gave them a treat to bring them and his pretended nephew acquainted. This entertainment lasted till night, when Allah ad Din would have taken leave of his uncle to go home. The magician would not let him go by himself, but conducted him to his mother, who, as soon as she saw him so well dressed, was transported with joy, and bestowed a thousand blessings upon the magician, for being at so great an expense upon her child. "'Generous relation!' said she. "'I know not how to thank you for your liberality. I know that my son is not deserving of your favours, and were he ever so grateful, and answered your good intentions, he would be unworthy of them. I thank you with all my soul, and wish you may live long enough to witness my son's gratitude, which he cannot better show than by regulating his conduct by your good advice.' "'Allah ad replied the magician, "'is a good boy, and I believe he shall do very well. "'But I am sorry for one thing, "'which is that I cannot perform to-morrow what I promised, "'because, as it is Friday, the shops will be shut up, "'and therefore we cannot hire or furnish one, "'but must wait till Saturday. "'I will, however, call on him to-morrow, "'and take him to walk in the gardens, "'where people of the best fashion generally resort.' Perhaps he has never seen these amusements. He has only hitherto been among children. But now he must see men. The African magician took his leave of the mother and the son, and retired. Allah ad Din, who was overjoyed to be so well clothed, anticipated the pleasure of walking in the gardens. He had never been out of the town, nor seen the environs, which were very beautiful and pleasant. Allah ad Din rose early the next morning, dressed himself to be ready when his uncle called on him, and, after he had waited some time, began to be impatient, and stood watching at the door. But as soon as he perceived him coming, he told his mother, took his leave of her, and ran to meet him. The magician caressed Allah ad Din and said, "'Come, my dear child, and I will show you fine things.' He then led him out at one of the gates of the city to some magnificent houses, or rather palaces, to each of which belonged beautiful gardens, into which anybody might enter. At every building he came to, he asked Allah ad Din if he did not think it fine, and the youth was ready to answer when any one presented itself, crying out, Here is a finer house, uncle, than any we have seen yet. By this artifice, the cunning magician led Allah ad Din some way into the country, and as he meant to carry him farther to execute his design, he took an opportunity to sit down in one of the gardens on the brink of a fountain of clear water, which discharged itself by a lion's mouth of bronze into a basin, pretending to be tired. "'Come, nephew,' said he, "'you must be weary as well as I. Let us rest ourselves, and we shall be better able to pursue our walk.' After they had sat down, the magician pulled from his girdle a handkerchief with cakes and fruit which he had provided, and laid them on the edge of the basin. He broke a cake in two, gave one half to Allah ad Din, and ate the other himself, and in regard to the fruit, left him at liberty to take which sort he liked best. During this short repast, he exhorted his nephew to leave off keeping company with vagabonds, and seek that of wise and prudent men, to improve by their conversation. For, said he, you will soon be at man's estate, and you cannot too early begin to imitate their example. When they had eaten as much as they liked, they got up and pursued their walk through gardens separated from one another only by small ditches, which marked out the limits without interrupting the communication. So great was the confidence the inhabitants reposed in each other. By this means, the African magician drew Allah ad Din insensibly beyond the gardens and crossed the country till they nearly reached the mountains. Allah ad Din, who had never been so far before, began to find himself much tired with so long a walk, and said to the magician, Where are we going, uncle? We have left the gardens a great way behind us, and I see nothing but mountains. If we go much farther, 
I do not know whether I shall be able to reach the town again. Never fear, nephew, said the false uncle. I will show you another garden, which surpasses all we have yet seen. It is not far off. And when we come there, you will say that you would have been sorry to have been so nigh and not seen it. Allah ad Deen was soon persuaded, and the magician, to make the way seem shorter and less fatiguing, told him a great many stories. At last they arrived between two mountains of moderate height and equal size, divided by a narrow valley, which was the place where the magician intended to execute the design that had brought him from Africa to China. "'We will go no farther now,' said he to Allah ad Deen. I will show you here some extraordinary things, which, when you have seen, you will thank me for. But while I strike a light, gather up all the loose dry sticks you can see, to kindle a fire with. Allah ad Deen found so many dried sticks, that before the magician had made a light, he had collected a great heap. The magician presently set them on fire, and when they were in a blaze, threw in some incense, which raised a cloud of smoke. This he dispersed on each side, by pronouncing several magical words, which Allah ad Deen did not understand. At the same time, the earth, trembling, opened just before the magician, and uncovered a stone laid horizontally, with a brass ring fixed into the middle. Allah ad Deen was so frightened at what he saw, that he would have run away. But the magician caught hold of him, abused him, and gave him such a box on the ear, that he knocked him down. Allah ad Deen got up trembling, and, with tears in his eyes, said to the magician, What have I done, uncle, to be treated in this severe manner? I have my reasons, answered the magician. I am your uncle, I supply the place of your father, and you ought to make no reply. But, child, added he, softening, do not be afraid, for I shall not ask anything of you, but that you obey me punctually, if you would reap the advantages which I intend you. These fair promises calmed Allah ad Deen's fears and resentment, and when the magician saw that he was appeased, he said to him, You see what I have done by virtue of my incense and the words I pronounced. Know then that under this stone there is hidden a treasure destined to be yours, and which will make you richer than the greatest monarch in the world. No person but yourself is permitted to lift this stone, or enter the cave, so you must punctually execute what I may command, for it is a matter of great consequence both to you and me. Allah ad Deen, amazed at all he saw and heard the magician say of the treasure which was to make him happy, forgot what was past, and rising said, Well, uncle, what is to be done? Command me, I am ready to obey. I am overjoyed, child, said the African magician, embracing him. Take hold of the ring, and lift up that stone. Indeed, uncle, replied Alla ad Deen, I am not strong enough. You must help me. You have no occasion for my assistance, answered the magician. If I help you, we shall be able to do nothing. Take hold of the ring, pronounce the names of your father and grandfather, then lift it up and you will find it will come easily. Allah ad Deen did as the magician bade him, raised the stone with ease, and laid it on one side. When the stone was pulled up, there appeared a cavity of about three or four feet deep, with a little door, and steps to go down lower. Observe, my son, said the African magician, what I direct. Descend into the cave, and when you are at the bottom of those steps, you will find a door open, which will lead you into a spacious vault, divided into three great halls, in each of which you will see four large brass cisterns, placed on each side, full of gold and silver. But take care you do not meddle with them. Before you enter the first hall, be sure to tuck up your vest, wrap it about you, and then pass through the second into the third, without stopping. Above all things, have a care that you do not touch the walls, so much as with your clothes. For if you do, you will die instantly. 
at the end of the third hall you will find a door which opens into a garden planted with fine trees loaded with fruit walk directly across the garden by a path which will lead you to five steps that will bring you upon a terrace where you will see a niche before you and in that niche a lighted lamp take the lamp down and extinguish it when you have thrown away the wick and poured out the liquor put it in your vest band and bring it to me do not be afraid that the liquor will spoil your clothes for it is not oil and the lamp will be dry as soon as it is thrown out if you should wish for any of the fruit of the garden you may gather as much as you please after these words the magician drew a ring off his finger and put it on one of Alla ad deens telling him that it was a preservative against all evil while he should observe what he had prescribed to him after this instruction he said go down boldly child and we shall both be rich all our lives alla ad deen jumped into the cave descended the steps and found the three halls just as the african magician had described he went through them with all the precaution the fear of death could inspire crossed the garden without stopping took down the lamp from the niche threw out the wick and the liquor and as the magician had desired put it in his vest band but as he came down from the terrace seeing it was perfectly dry he stopped in the garden to observe the fruit which he only had a glimpse of in crossing it all the trees were loaded with extraordinary fruit of different colours on each tree some bore fruit entirely white and some clear and transparent as crystal some pale red and others deeper some green blue and purple and others yellow in short there was fruit of all colours the white were pearls the clear and transparent diamonds the deep red rubies the paler rubies the green emeralds the blue turquoises the purple amethysts and those that were of yellow cast sapphires alla ad deen was altogether ignorant of their worth and would have preferred figs and grapes or any other fruits but though he took them only for coloured glass of little value yet he was so pleased with the variety of the colours and the beauty and extraordinary size of the seeming fruit that he resolved to gather some of every sort and accordingly filled the two new purses his uncle had bought for him with his clothes some he wrapped up in the skirts of his vest which was of silk large and wrapping and crammed his bosom as full as it could hold alla ad deen having thus loaded himself with riches he knew not the value of returned through the three halls with the same precaution made all the haste he could that he might not make his uncle wait and soon arrived at the mouth of the cave where the african magician expected him with the utmost impatience as soon as alla ad deen saw him he cried out pray uncle lend me your hand to help me out give me the lamp first replied the magician it will be troublesome to you indeed uncle answered alla ad deen i cannot now it is not troublesome to me but i will as soon as i am up the african magician was so obstinate that he would have the lamp before he would help him up and alla ad deen who had encumbered himself so much with his fruit that he could not well get at it refused to give it to him till he was out of the cave the african magician provoked at this obstinate refusal flew into a passion threw a little of his incense into the fire which he had taken care to keep in and no sooner pronounced two magical words than the stone which had closed the mouth of the cave moved into its place with the earth over it in the same manner as it lay at the arrival of the magician and alla ad deen this action of the african magicians plainly showed him to be neither alla ad deen's uncle nor mustapha the tailor's brother but a true african africa is a country whose inhabitants delight most in magic of any in the whole world and he had applied himself to it from his youth after forty years experience in enchantments geomancy fumigations and reading of magic books 
he had found out that there was in the world a wonderful lamp, the possession of which would render him more powerful than any monarch. And by a late operation of geomancy, he had discovered that this lamp lay concealed in a subterraneous place in the midst of China, in the situation already described. Fully persuaded of the truth of this discovery, he set out from the farthest part of Africa, and after a long and fatiguing journey, came to the town nearest to this treasure. But though he had a certain knowledge of the place where the lamp was, he was not permitted to take it himself, nor to enter the subterraneous place, but must receive it from the hands of another person. For this reason he had addressed himself to Allah ad -Din, whom he looked upon as a young lad whose life was of no consequence, and fit to serve his purpose, resolving, as soon as he should get the lamp into his hands, to sacrifice him to his avarice and wickedness by making the fumigation mentioned before, and repeating two magical words, the effect of which would remove the stone into its place, so that no witness would remain of the transaction. The blow he had given Allah ad -Din was intended to make him obey the more readily, and give him the lamp as soon as he should ask for it. But his too great precipitation, and his fear lest somebody should come that way during their dispute, and discover what he wished to keep secret, produced an effect quite contrary to what he had proposed to himself. When the African magician saw that all his hopes were frustrated for ever, he returned the same day for Africa, but went quite round the town, and at some distance from it, lest some persons who had observed him walk out with a boy, on seeing him come back without him, should entertain any suspicions and stop him. According to all appearances, there was no prospect of Allah ad -Din being any more heard of. But the magician, when he had contrived his death, forgot the ring he had put upon his finger, which preserved him, though he knew not its virtue. It may seem astonishing that the loss of that, together with the lamp, did not drive the magician to despair. But magicians are so much used to misfortunes, and events contrary to their wishes, that they do not lay them to heart, but still feed themselves to the end of life with unsubstantial notions and chimeras. The surprise of Allah ad -Din, who had never suspected this treachery from his pretended uncle, after all his caresses, and what he had done for him, is more easily to be imagined than expressed. When he found himself buried alive, he cried, and called out to his uncle, to tell him he was ready to give him the lamp, but in vain, since his cries could not be heard. He descended to the bottom of the steps, with a design to get into the garden, but the door which was opened before by enchantment, was now shut by the same means. He then redoubled his cries and tears, sat down on the steps, without any hopes of ever seeing light again, and in a melancholy certainty of passing from the present darkness into that of a speedy death. End of section 16